Hey, top of the morning to you. I'm Michael. Great kids call me Rue. Thanks for being on the show this morning. It is Monday morning. It is the, uh, isn't it crazy that I don't know? It's the 27th day of June. Um, June came in um, like a uh, a uh, British stove that stays on all the time in Aga. You know, those stoves that are in Ireland. You know, when you're, Ruth probably has one of these in her kitchen. You know, the, the stove that has the hot plates that stays on all the time. You're going like... This stove is great in the winter, but it is hot all the time. And so June has been that way. We had our hottest day that I have ever had in Charlotte. It was 101 point something um, a week ago. And so <clears throat> you just said, I think I'm going to stay inside. and uh, Or I'm just going to be like the dog. I'm going to drive to town with my head out the window. I, 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 and it felt pretty good. It was kind of hard to see a little bit, but I had to go get my glasses, you know, the ones that I wear on my uh, welding helmet. <clears throat> All right, so glad you're on the show today. It's Monday, and uh, and I'm here going to just do a, a quick review with you. And um, <laughs> my office my office needs a review. My office needs a renew. My office needs a renovation, I think, or my studio, whatever I call this place. Anyway, glad you're on the show today. I'm going to say hello to some of you, and then i got to show you a couple things that I started on on Saturday that I finished, uh, and also just picked up a ton of, I'm just a crazy person, I guess. Um, I, I, I um, you know, when I leave this planet, when, when um, good, the good Lord calls me home, the people who clean up after me <laughs> are going to find little pieces of paper just stuffed everywhere. It's like, it's like a woman's recipe, and I don't mean this in a... Um, um, a, uh, a bad way because I love it where Carol puts all her recipes and she has them just tucked down into things and like her mother when her mother left this planet we found notes and lists and Carol will have lists of everything she ate in Colorado and, and I'll have little pieces of art and quotes squibbled on everything I love the men whose shoulders I stand on who I've gone before and I love I love my scripture verses for that reason too but I, I love these little comments and quotes and, and things that I'll write down or I'll take a snapshot of and then I'll print them out and <clears throat> they they give hope and meaning to this world that I live on that helped me focus, I, thought, I think, on what's important. And so as I move through that, but I find these little pieces of paper, it's it's just kind of, it's kind of sad. Uh, up here behind my lamp, I just saw all of these little notes. And there's, look, there's a painting, there's a painting, there's a painting. I'm going to leave that one out today. I need to paint a rooster and a banjo. And there's a painting. That's the one I threw out of the, the auction the other night. I said, I, I'd love to sell that shrimp, but I'm not. I painted it in 2006 or seven. And here's a couple that I kept. See, I'm doing it already. I'm putting them back up there. I have all these little pieces. Um, look, they're just quotes and comments and notes. And um, 
One of my favorite roosters of all time is right there. And here's a little rooster that was given to me by a little girl. I sketched it in a restaurant, gave it to her, and 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 uh, Aaron, uh, she she sketched it and brought it back. And I said, well, I gave it to you, but I have to do you another one. She said, well, I have to do you another one. I'm going like, I went to meet her parents. I said, who is this little girl? I love what you've done with her. It was awesome. And I got to show you that card right there. Okay. So uh, these these things just, and there's something I've been looking for for two weeks. I didn't know where that was. I'll put it right here where it goes right now. Boom. Okay. So um, my point is this, is that I hope your studio has reflections of you being in it doing some of this. That's my point in all that. Maybe that's the point that I just came to thinking like, why do you do this? And this may be the answer. Um, little Look at this. Here's here's a little couple of black and whites. Um, look at, here's a guy fly fishing and I saw this on a brochure somewhere. And while I was sitting there, I just doodled it in. And this of course is my, uh, my carrot people that Bob Burgess is so grand at. Let's give him credit for all of that. The pastis in an artist is to steal from other artists, but not, not steal to make it yours, but steal to make you better. And then you move it into your style. Did you hear what I said there? Not just steal to make it yours, to steal to borrow pieces from and learn from them and move through. That's what the French apprentice programs did. That's the pastis. Okay, so um, anyway, there's uh, this little carrot people. How long has it been since you've done some carrot people? They're just cool. Look at that dude. He's just standing there. His little jacket is shaded, and I just did that with a little extra. This is just black ink that I picked up on a brush and just went... Pfft. Well, I'll be. It looks like my granddad who stood out there, he would have had on a hat and stood out there and said, well, I'll be. But look at look at some of these pieces that I just just picked up. Um, maybe some were left over from the auction the other night. There's some flies that didn't go. There's a couple of fishing flies. Here's, here's a bunch of fishing flies. I thought this was a word. And I thought, what's it say? And then it says, it's a... Um, uh, it's a Campania Dunn, it's a poly wing, it's a thorax, and it's a no hackle. And so those are all real fishing flies that I just sketched on my little 80 pound sketch paper. What, what would make this paper go from zero to 60 is that if it were naturally white, excuse me, if it were bright white instead of natural white. I just love the bright white. And I'm going to keep saying that until I have to start my own paper company and, uh, and find it. Look at, look at the difference. There it is right there. Can you see that? These flies would have popped on this piece of paper. In fact, I'll paint on that piece of paper. Uh, this is the painting that I've done for uh, Hobby Lobby, uh, Deanne, and I'm going to send it to her probably today, um, tomorrow for sure. And then I did another one just as you guys were watching me Saturday morning. I'm going to do a quick review on that right now just so you can see and here, if you didn't see Saturday's show, what I think about that paper, got to tell you this, literally um, went down to make another cup of tea after the show, and uh, my doorbell just goes, pff, pff. it doesn't do the Avon thing, it doesn't go any of that, it just goes, pff. and so it probably needs a battery, so, um, you know, but people have knuckles, they can just knock on my door, and so um, I... Um, there was a box sitting there, and it had a pad of um, Hobby Lobby, new, the new paper in it. I'll show you the difference in the covers from the one I had to the new cover. Same paper. And then it also had a mixed media book, and I want to tell you a little bit about that. And that's coming up in just one second. So don't go away. I'm going to say hello to some of you. And... Um, just jump on. Thank you, Tamberly Marie. Pat Brooks jumped on the show first. Thank you so much this morning, Pat. Appreciate all your notes. Tamberly, thank you. Uh, Kathy Morrow, Denise Albright, Paula Lindy, Susan Peters. Well, welcome. Uh, Janice Scott, Chris Young, Linda Schleitning from Always Beautiful Ohio. You know, uh, the Chamber of Commerce needs to know, Linda, that you always put an adjective with Ohio. You can say steamy, hot, hot cold, uh, warm, rainy, but you always put some sort of adjective out there. And I'm, I'm sure the Chamber of Commerce would appreciate that. I'm just giving you a hard time, but I think it's funny. I love it. I did get a note from uh, Bob up in the uh, uh, voracious cornfields of uh, Iowa, and um, he's he's doing well, and uh, he's he's thankful to to be painting. And he's you know he's in the middle of uh, farming season and life, and and so I said, Bob, we miss your 33. Uh, Bob 33 is who I call him these days. But uh, Donna Buckley, thanks for being on the show. Gene Peterson, Nancy Catlett, thank you always. Um, you and Steve are there together. Well, you are in the photo. You're in different parts of the room probably having a different coffee. <laughs> 
I harass my friends up there in Virginia. Uh, Deborah Tauber, Mary and Atwad, Morning Glory, checking in before I visit my son in the hospital, praying for Ferris. Boom, I'll jump onto that bandwagon. I'll put Ferris's name on uh, the board here. Um, is it two R's? It is. Ferris. Uh, Marion. Okay. Boom. I've got a pin right there. There it is. I'm going to stick it right there uh, underneath my uh, Yasutoma brushes. And now I'll see Ferris right there. That's kind of my fun little wall there. Uh, someday somebody's going to come here and go, what? In, did he have a dart board here? I could just pins all in the wall. It's not a, could have put up a bulletin board. Heather Kuman, thanks for being on the show. Gene Anthalzer. Uh, Ricky uh, Bastinis Govars. Govars. I feel like you need to say your name like Govars. Uh, Jennifer Yen, thanks for being on the show. Gretchen, hey, welcome. Haven't seen you in a while. Elaine Barnett. Uh, Anita Johnson from Northeast Ohio. There's Steve. Good morning, Steve. Don Faust. Um, hello. Hello, Don. Don would be a good morning name, huh? Give all my uh, give all these people a hard time. Mickey Perkins, thanks for being on the show. Um, Cheryl Hoffman, let's see, I'm skipping through here. Lisa Predisor, uh, Landingham, Linda Landingham, thank you for being on. Um, but I'm John Robert Small, saw your name go by. Thank you, Fern Skelly, Kim Sheets, Sue Kane, all the way from, yes, of course, Southern Australia. Um, so I like, uh, so I like that you have little pieces of stuff. <laughs> Mickey Perkins says, um, it's a rootiful week. All right, here we go. Uh, June Jones, I got your address. Uh, the word Niceville was missing on that. It was somewhere in Florida, but I never could. So I found out I probably didn't mail it. I thought I mailed you a bag a long time ago, but then I sent a note that said, uh, on your note or card, there was a. Uh, the city was missing, so thanks for. Uh, I will. I have a note to send you uh, your bug out bag. I am so sorry, uh, just tardiness on my part of traveling and doing what I do for a living, which I'm not even sure what that is, but I do know it's production. The next two days, I'm doing some pretty heavy shooting. I will do my Patreon class of Good News Rue tomorrow, and then I'm off to uh, uh, two days of shooting. So, uh, ta da! Landed it. There's a little. Uh, He's uh, he's not numbered. He would be 204. That's my number B. There's on the back. I'm up to 204. There's some little paintings. Look at these. These are just, look at that. Why would I paint a fish eating a fly? There's a little another one of my chunky lobsters. Um, here is, is this B? He's 83. See, he's, this, I, this one's been painted late on my desk for a while. There's another little lobster. <laughs> Uh, there's 82. So I j apparently I just sat one day and said, okay, I like that B. Let's do another one. See the shadowing here on this one? I like that. I like that. Um, I, I think their wings are a little large, but um, you know what the artist can say? I'd fit the paper. All right. So these are little uh, little ditties that sometimes I sell, sometimes I give away. One day I'll just run a little, well, I'll do it sometimes in the auction. I'll pile them up together and sell them at a price, a cheap price. So, Let's jump on this paper thing real quickly and just a review here. Uh, Carol Todd Mundy, uh, beautiful. Thanks for being on. Virginia Mann. Rhonda Dehart from Faith, North Carolina. Marion Jones. Let's paint. I'm going to paint this morning, but I'm going to paint something on. Uh, uh, love that fish, Heather says. Okay. Fish with his mouth open. I threw it down there somewhere. This is the paper that, um, yes, here's the paper that I purchased coming out of Florida because uh, Hobby Lobby folks had called and or sent me a note and said, hey, um, we're going to send you some of that paper. It's taking a while to get in, but this is showing up. And let me show you what is showing up. It, it's the same cover, but notice they've changed the layout of the font. Uh, this is a little cleaner. I like this, actually. Um, so if y'all are paying attention. A um, little lighter gray. Um, I, I think it's probably just whatever they want to do. But um, I, I like this uh, left margin thing. I like this font better than this font. You know, that doesn't matter. It's a blue. But look at what they've done with the paper. Nothing. Uh, they have changed it. Look at me pieces I've used out of this already. And these paintings were done on this paper. And I got to tell you, 
it is so it's not 100% cotton, but that doesn't bother me for some of my working paper day in day out. I just I like the feel of it. I like it uh, about as much as I like uh, even the fluid, not the fluid 100 is 100% cotton, but the regular fluid paper that you get, I really like it. I like it better than um, the, uh, I'm going to compare it to some, the loft papers. Yes, most certainly. I like it better than um, the off the, the shelf um, Strathmore papers. Yes. So there's a lot of things that I really love about this. And I'm going to tell you, uh, this size is perfect. It's extra white uh, for the making my colors pop. This little color shrimp that I did in about four minutes just to give you a demo. This was the other demo that I did Saturday morning. And I pointed out some things that I'll do it again if you're just jumping on the show. This is a Hobby Lobby paper. It's new this year. It's coming out. It's hitting all of them. Why am I telling you this? Well, because these kind people came up and spent 15 minutes with me in Orlando and talked to me about paper and what I liked. And I said, look, honestly, I I'm not a skilled schooled watercolor artist, but I paint a lot of watercolors for people and I give a lot away. I sell a lot and I love encouraging people to paint and they need good uh, paint, paper to paint on. And so that's when they ask, what do you like about our paper now? And I said, here's what I like. Here's what I don't like. And what I didn't like was the repeating patterns in um, the stamp that looked like it was certainly on their six by six. And I'd had another uh, size from them. I think a nine by 12 piece that I tried and it looked like just a repeat of that paper. The six by six was just cut smaller. It, the, the background of the paper itself, the, the undulations, the, the, the rough, this is 140 pound cold press. Okay. Cold press, cold, hot and cold press, hot press. You've, you've earned your shirt. Cold press, I didn't, didn't iron it. That's, that's the best way I can help people learn in the beginning stages. I need to feel it. The backside of this is a little slicker. Some of you, it's not completely what I'd call hot press, but they are coming out with a hot press version of this. If they stick with this color in hot press, uh, you flower painters, uh, quick slip, uh, Chris Whitaker, you're going to love it for your, your, um, illustration type stuff that you do. And, and also, Pat, you're going to like it, I think, for uh, the Micron pens, which are not, Kilimanjaro does kill Microns, and, and it uh, kill, when I mean kill them, it just eats the ends off of them. Because, but in watercolor, I love those undulations, and that's that 100% right cotton. It's hard to even draw on cotton with um, a fountain pen. Impossible sometimes. All right, so this is 140 pound. Um, and so the repeating pattern in here, I, look, I I wish I had one of my early six by sixes that were on some Hobby Lobby. I felt like after I painted and let my translucent colors just bleed and come through, I could go in and see a repeating pattern that didn't look natural to me. It looked like it was forced or it was printed on, and I didn't care for that. So that's what bothered me. Um, if I'm a blacksmith, oh wait, I'm a blacksmith. When I blacksmith something and I spend time hammering it out and I get it forged in such a way that I really like it and I like the irregularities of the hammer marks and I like the twist and the turns and I love all those little things in there. The worst thing I could do to this piece of metal, this is a little leaf that I forged as a brush rest one time. I was thinking, hey, that'd be cool brush rest. And I went, ah, it's silly. I don't need a brush rest. Just throw it down. <laughs> I was forging and, and, and a, a lady wanted one of these one day and she said, you know, that'd be just beautiful painted black. And I said, seriously? And she looked at me and I said, okay, I just offended you. And she said, no, no, you didn't, but tell me why you said that. And, I, and you were so quick to say it. And I said, if I paint it black, it's going to look like I, I bought it at Target and it's made out of plastic. I have rubbed this down with beeswax the way that the pioneers did it back then, not because I'm a purist, but because I love beeswax and I like the smell of beeswax. And also after I brush it and heat it up, that beeswax seeps down into it and it's a natural inhibitor of rust. And she went, Oh, I didn't know all that. And I go, that's just all the stuff that when you think like an artist, you think like that. But so I don't want to paint this ironwork black. I don't want it to look like it's machine made or pressed or printed. I want it to look natural. And so that's 
a, maybe a better description of why I like it when the paper looks like it just was like in the middle of a big vat and it came up out and it got rolled over with the undulations and it wasn't a repeating pattern. It doesn't look like the mopped ceilings. And you go splotch, 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 splotch. And you go, that's certainly man-made. Nothing in nature would look like that. Okay, so that's kind of the thing I really have loved about this new paper so far. So here's the two booklets. This was the one that uh, I purchased. Uh, disclaimer, they sent me this one for free. Um, it's 15 sheets. Is that right? 15 sheets of 140 pound for $6.99. And I, here's what I've loved to do with it already. I have loved to, and I've done, I did it last night. Gave away two little paintings last night while we were at the uh, symphony. Um, I've already used those 15 sheets of that. I grab it in my little splitter like this. I take it apart. I go here. Da, da, da. Boom. I cut it here. I slide it to here like this. Boom. I slide those in my bug out bag like so. Do I measure that? No. I don't care if they don't uh, equal the same part. I put these, this beautiful little paper, um, in my little bug out bag. Zip. Drop it in. Throw it down in there like this. Uh, sometimes I'll put it in my little leather uh, uh Field Notes Keeper, drop it in here with my uh, to-go paint, either my uh, Altoid box or this one here, and a, a small brush, a bamboo brush, one of my, what you also told me, water brushes, a couple pins, uh, the one I usually have in my pocket, I don't see it here now, my fountain pen, which is lost, I'll probably need it to sketch with this morning. Anyway, I throw all that in there and I'm, I'm ready to go. And uh, so I had my small notebook with me last night and I had one of these brushes in my pad and I sit and I did a couple little paintings while I was listening to um, the symphony. And, uh, you know, just sip a glass of tea and, uh, or sip whatever. I'm just a tea guy. All right. So that'll give you an idea on that. Let me show you one more thing about uh, Hobby Lobby that they've just changed. They sent me this. Look at this. 60 sheets of a mixed media paper. It's 110 pound. Ready for the price? $7.99. Come on. Great office workbook. So I'm thinking this is going to be grand, but when I turn in, take a look at the paper versus this paper. See it? See the difference? You can't see it as well as I can, but let me tell you, this is really uh, brown natural, not brown, but it is tan to me. Uh, however, they included this note. DD sent, DN sent this note. We are considering changing our mixed media pads to this paper. Okay? Now, this paper... It's probably 138, maybe 120, definitely over 110, which is what this paper is. And so I sent them a note back and said, holy smokes, if you can get this paper in this journal, and even if you have to cut out 20 pages, I'll still pay this for it to have that as a travel journal, uh, go for it. And so, uh, I'm going to paint on one of these pieces of paper for you this morning. So I'm loving this so far. And thank you, Hobby Lobby, for sending me that stuff. This will be a great little workbook for me to take notes on and stuff. But I'm, uh, and maybe just do some preliminary sketches. Um, I just don't care for a natural white. It doesn't make the watercolors pop. And I'm just that guy. Okay. Um, here's a little watercolor card for you. Take a look at this. Um, I got to tell you about this. My wife wrote on it. You can see that, right? But this was uh, when my son, Nathan, was in the eighth grade. His card was selected for uh, the artwork. And uh, they used to print to the St. John's Public Educational Foundation. Carol was a part of that in Florida. Uh, used to choose four pieces of art each year, and they would make cards out of it. And my son's fish. So he actually traced out these fish with some paper and then colored them all in and cut them out. And that dude was ahead of his time. Uh, so there's some more painting. This is uh, it's one of my favorite paintings right here. And I've had this painting since 2010. 2010, it says the world suddenly stopped. Ronnie's suit matched his bowling ball. What does that mean? Who knows? I'm just that crazy guy. Okay. So enough, enough on that today, enough on paper. I'm going to paint on this uh, Hobby Lobby piece right here. I'm going to keep uh, Deanne's note, and I'll send her another note. I think I did send her a note already this morning. Um, Hobby Lobby, thank you. I'll try and send you this video cutout.
So you'll go from there. All right. So does that catch everybody up? Here is the painting I did. What I was going to point to a while ago when I went off on a tangent for a long time. Sorry. This is important, though, because you guys paint and you want to know what supplies are out there and you want to know what you do. Use good paint. Use the best paper you can afford. Use good brushes. You don't have to have sables, but if, if somebody has donated brushes to you, for heaven's sakes, use them. I love bamboo brushes because they're loose and they help me paint looser. Um, I love the way they just dance around and I love the lightness of them. You know, I like heavy pins, but I love the lightness of a brush to dance around. This to me is the thing that I love in watercolor that makes it look so authentic and original and hand done. It's these little hard lines that, that appear once this dries and I love it. I just, I, I mean, I, that, that's the thing. And I just go, that makes me excited every time I see it. And I'm just that old guy who still gets fired up. This is the bluebird I did on that paper. And remember, I spilled some ink there and I just turned it into a dragonfly. I kind of like that painting. All right, here we go. Last night, um, if you got any questions, uh, you can always just drop off a little QQQ and I'll try to get to them. What happened to the orchestra that you you would add a musician every now and then. I uh, oh wow, Linda, well, that's a great thing. It's uh, it's in a box over there, and uh, I still have that painting. It, remember that? That's funny. I started, and every day I just add another player in the orchestra. I finally got to the point where I ran out of paper. I'll see if I can dig that up and show it to you. What a great question! I love it. Thank you so much for remembering that. <laughs> that's uh, that's awesome. All right, so uh, last night I went to hear the orchestra, and um, after the, we didn't we didn't follow the uh, the script. We're sixty yards from the orchestra. Uh, there's a road between us and some trees, but we sit at some tables, uh, and because uh, we're carrying on conversations with friends, and we want the music in the background, and because you can certainly hear it from where we are. And so as it started, we realized that oh my gosh, we've come on a night of opera. And so they had uh, a very uh, trained uh, soprano and a baritone, a tenor, and the orchestra was... And they started with George Bizet. Uh, if you don't know George Bizet, he wrote the Habanera, which is from Carmen. If you don't know anything else, you probably heard it in Bugs Bunny cartoons many, many times. And so uh, we listened to it. And she... Her voice sounded like she was at the table next door. We're going like, oh my gosh. And it is just, you got to realize there's a bowl. We're sitting up on a hill. So this, this sound is coming up. And I'm thinking we're getting as good a sound as the people right from the orchestra from where we're sitting. And so uh, they're singing that. And so this weird thought occurred to me after about 15 minutes of opera sung in uh, probably uh, German or uh, Italian um Latin, who knows, I, 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 I couldn't make out any of the words, but what came to me was this, uh, what came to me was this crazy thought of um, the, the juxtaposition between bluegrass music and opera. And you're going like, he ain't right with himself. And you know that's, that's right, okay, I'm, I'm not arguing with that. That's, he just ain't right with himself. And so I thought, you know, it's been a while since I've painted a banjo. And so um, I thought I'd do a little uh, bluegrass piece here. But here's why I'm going to do this piece. Um, what made me think that the, the correlation between the two um, uh, and what, what made me uh, excited was um, I don't hardly ever do a rooster looking down like this, so that's kind of a fun little look. Was that um, after you hear bluegrass music for about 20 minutes and you realize you've got that three, uh, the Scruggs style picking, and you go like, wait, didn't I just hear this in the last song? And look, I love bluegrass music and I'm a banjo picker. Well, I'm a, I'm a someone who plays sometimes. Let's see if I can hit my banjo over there. I hit one note. It's hanging on the wall over there. So sometimes I do still uh, reach over there and get it and pretend that I can play. I gave it up years ago. Me and the, it made everybody howl, including the dogs. And so the point is, is that after a while, the opera, 
And then it builds up, and then another, and then a major third comes in, and then there's a, and, it would be, and I went like, well, this is, there's no difference between um, opera and, and uh, bluegrass. And <laughs> so that made me think I hadn't painted a rooster in a while with a, um, playing a banjo. And so I thought I'd just do a quick little sketch. And this is on that paper that uh, uh, I think I'm painting on the back of it. No, this is the pieces that I ripped out to cut, isn't it? I don't know. It, it, uh, I think it's not going to be this heavy, but it's going to be good paper. And I just have encouraged those guys already to put that in their um, their mixed media book because I'm really I'm loving this. Can you imagine uh, if this were even if it were 20 pages less? This has 60 sheets in it. If it had 40 sheets, I'd still pay eight bucks for this to take it out and have just white journal paper that I could rip off of. And, and I know Kenson makes one. Uh, it's about uh, or mixed media or um, makes one uh, that's about 138 pounds, and I'm pushing them to go for that. I'm not pushing, I'm just suggesting, because they asked me my two cents. So there's my two cents, and I'm sticking to it. All right, so when I paint something like this, just a real quick little uh, random mess-up piece, um, I really kind of love doing this, and I don't. these are why I wind up with so many pieces on my desk. I love doing this, wake up these colors, Let's give them a little bit of uh, just a little water spray here with a mist bottle just to say, wake up a little bit, loosens them up before I stick my brush down in there and turn them into, turn my brush into mess. Um, I'm going to just do this like I would. I'm going to just actually paint with a little bit of water first. Just, uh, and this is not the cleanest water in the world. I didn't change it this morning because I wanted it to just be a little bit uh, pale and, and uh, dirty. It looks like dishwater from last night's um, gristle. <laughs> I actually had fish and chips because I was out, out last night eating. So that's what I had for dinner. There's a little napkin to keep all this going. And so let's just do a little bit of a uh, little bit of painting here. So I'm gonna grab a little bit. This has already softened this up. Don't you love that? Uh, people ask me questions. Are you concerned that your paint is going to mold or mildew? Uh, no. I'm not. Never even thought of it. Never even worried about it. Um, don't care if it does. Did you see what happened there? I actually remember I put a lot of water on here. So I broke the dike right here and the red started shooting down through the body of the rooster. And I reached over and stopped it with a paper towel. Didn't want that to go running down through there yet until I'm ready. Watch this when I'm ready. Whoops. When I'm ready, what I'm going to do is we'll get a little more yellow in here like this. And then I'm just going to touch that red right there now and let it run in. See that? Now I broke the dam or the dike and I let it to floodplain. And so that's how I get some of those broken lines. Did you catch that? Let the water do what watercolor does. Put the water in first and then add some color and then just break the dike a little bit. If that's too much for you, go in there and take a little paper towel, soak some of it up and then go back in and add your primary color that you wanted it to be in the first place. You, you're in control of watercolor, and you think you're not. Sometimes you are not if you get too messy. Um, but that's one of the things I like about watercolor anyway is it's pretty unpredictable. It makes me uh, kind of get excited about uh, what the color does that I have no control over. Just drop a little of that in there, a little bit of this purple in there. I think we've got to have that a little more red in here just right in here in this purple. And then I think I want a little bit of uh, just some rusty uh, rusty colored in here, just like he's a, he's a rooster on the farm. I don't want a bit too uptown. I'm not doing opera, I'm doing bluegrass, um, but there is a correlation I figured out last night, so. Um, I can tell this is not cotton paper simply because of the way that the, the colors are running. Cotton paper grabs the colors a little faster and holds them a little tighter, and you have to use a little more water. Did everybody catch that? People say, gosh, I, I don't understand the Kilimanjaro paper, why you love it so much. Oh, I'll tell you what, it's a key for me as to how much water to use and how much water not to use. Remember, it's called watercolor, and so this is the, this is the key for me. It's knowing when to add water, when to take water away, when to add color, when to add more pigment, and make it work the way you want it to work. And I think that's part of what you sort of have to study a little bit as you, and, and 
I know in my subconscious and even in my daily routine, that's exactly why you'll see me have a stack of just paintings like this on my desk or the ones I threw down there. It's simply because that's a constant practice for me. I never stop practicing that, okay? That's the thing that I do most all the time. Man, to see this music right here would have been some great music last night. All right, watercolor. And he was right. I had taught a private watercolor lesson for two women who didn't want to spend as much for materials. They bought a beginner's watercolor paint. Very expensive paper. They didn't paint. Well, yep, I'm telling you. Pat, you got to say, don't, yeah. Um, if you really want to see your watercolor expand. Some of you have been painting with me for two, three years now. And you're going like, well, I don't feel like my paintings are getting any better. And it may be because you still are using Crayola paint. I just said it. I don't say it to offend you. I don't even know you other than your comments online. So I'm just saying, um, sell a few paintings at the at the mailbox. You know, just go down there and set up a little lemonade stand and, and raise yourself 50 bucks or 100 bucks and then go and buy some good paper, some good paint that's got pigment in it. Some of you who paint with Daniel Smith or QR, Q, Q, QR uh, uh, or... Um, uh, Holbin or, you know, just whoever you want to paint with. Uh, I use American Journey because I love the pigment. I love the light facets. There's a lot of reasons I use it. And it's it's not as expensive as Sennelier. Okay, if I buy Sennelier paint, that little one pack of Sennelier's that I have, if I bought that off the market, um, that would have cost me 150 bucks for that little thing of Sennelier paints. I had a friend who sent that to me. But I'm just as happy by mixing the colors for less than half of that money with American Journey paints. And I love the colors of them. And they seem to be very light fast. And I've been doing this now for, as I keep looking, I'm thinking, wow, there was a painting that I painted in 2010 and it's been hanging here on my wall and on a little card and it still looks pretty dang good. I painted it this way. Look, that hasn't faded a bit. Now I've kept it out of direct sunlight, but don't ever hang your paint. You know, hang your, um, car seats in uh, direct sunlight and you're going to ruin them. Your, your best shirts, your uh, give me your tired, your huddle masses, whatever. You know where I'm headed with that. Maybe you don't. Okay, a little uh, mixed paint here. Remember, I just always keep a little bit in this one. I don't, I mix mostly on the painting, but every now and then I'll just reach over here and grab a little bit of this paint that I've pre-mixed in here. I'm not sure what he's standing on. I thought it was going to be a bucket. Now it sort of looks like a, oh, oh it's an apple butter pot. <laughs> okay, so I just made that up. That's what it looks like to me, though. It looks like a brass apple butter pot. You ever make apple butter on your farms? Man, now we're talking. All right, let's get a little, uh, little bit of this color right here. I think uh, maybe a little bit of pecan color. What? Never heard him say that before. I think I want the banjo neck a little pecan. There it is right there. Just a little pecan color. Look a little natural. But I think I want the head of it a little black. Just a little ebony there. My banjo that is in Tokyo now. Uh, I sold my banjo to uh, a gentleman in Tokyo who collected American folk instruments and played for middle school kids in school. Come on. Who wouldn't want to sell a banjo for that purpose? He um, he wanted uh, my banjo, and it was handmade by a guy named Bud Sosme, who's no longer on this planet. Bud had handmade it, and he had uh, the neck had a stripe up the back that was a curly bird eye maple with a piece of pecan down the middle, and uh, ebony uh, headstock, and uh, a daring tone ring, and it was just it was an open. It's called the Showboat. It had a star uh, on it up there. It was just a great banjo. I love that banjo, but I couldn't play it worth a flop. And so uh, the time came when I needed uh, to make some money for my son's wedding, and my wife and I decided let's just have a little eBay sale, which we do from time to time. We sell some crazy things on eBay, and uh, and we sold that rascal. And the, and the guy wound up giving me an extra $50 as a wedding gift for my son. <laughs> and I still, by the way, I still in touch with him sometimes. He is, uh, 
uh, he has retired from teaching, and uh, but he's still collecting instruments. I think he has like 50 banjos now. Um, the Japanese man who uh, who 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 uh, still plays American bluegrass music, and I wonder if he's ever compared bluegrass to opera. <laughs> All right, so that's a nice little uh, look at it. He's standing on the apple butter pot, and um, um, it's about apple butter making time. You know, I love it in the summer because you get some summer apples that come in, and then you start getting your fall apples and. Um, so late summer, we started making apple butter when I lived in the mountains of Western North Carolina, we'd take some summer trips over to, uh, Hickory Nut Gap and we would go in there to the orchards and, uh, our friends had an orchard there and we'd go in and get some, uh, paint, uh, some apples, start to say paintings from them. That shows you what I'm looking at a painting. Um, I think I need a little bit of this turquoise here just to drop in on the side of these, some, some feathers coming out right there. Um. All right, so I just piddle around and I make little paintings like this, and then um, I'm, I'm thinking that this probably has to have some strings on the banjo. I'm thinking it probably has to have a few other little things. One of the things I can do now is take a fountain pen and go in on this. And this this paper, even though it's not my regular 140 pound, um, uh, it's it's holding these pretty well. What you will notice is that I'm going to get some nice little hard edges like you're going to get with a softer paper without the... Um, uh, rag cotton, but uh, I've got to be careful with the water. Remember, I started with a lot. I'm going to do another little sample to show you. I started with a lot more water on this, and so you're going to get more of a crossover blend with less holidays. So you got to be careful, uh, especially if you're using a, a bamboo brush. This Yasutomo will blow some water in there. They carry a lot more water than your regular watercolor brushes. So if you're afraid of water, you might want to stay with a round uh, and I use American Journey for that, but you might want to stay with a round brush. If you like throwing in a lot of water, that's where a Yasutomo brush might help you. So I know I say this stuff over and over and over, but sometimes until you really experience it, you don't know what the heck he's talking about. Uh, uh, Jean says she was packing up her room, found some good stuff. Um, Heather says she has a banjo <laughs> playing Rooster of Yours. I framed it up and my daughter stole it. <laughs> All right. I love that when the children steal stuff, they say, hey, I'm taking this. You mean you're stealing it? Yeah, that's it. Uh, try a new brand of paper. Um, woo, a Bay Hong Pure Cotton 300-pound rough. All right, Donna, I'm going to tell you, it will be like riding on a piece of asphalt, but you're going to love it. 300-pound paper is, is tough to get used to. It takes a lot more water. To move the paint around because it's just going to go it's going to be sometimes you'll think it's like painting on a sponge you'll put something down you'll go whoa where did that paint go it went in the paper and so that's going to be fun for you to try um, <clears throat> um plenty of banjo playing roosters coming down the pike uh, yep Banjo Roo is still my all-time favorite. Got to be. I mean, come on. Something about uh, something about a rooster playing a banjo that just kind of makes you want to. Uh... <laughs> Miss Carla says she's painting, making pickles today. Um, you know, the only cucumber joke I know is uh, cucumber. That's when you yell when the pickles are ready. Cucumber. My friend, friend came up with that. We did a whole deal on... Um, Cool as a uke. And he'd say, No, it's cool as a cuke. And I go, No, I don't I don't think he got that right. And he goes, Yeah, it's cool as a cool as a uke. And I say, you know the saying was cool as a cuke. And why would anybody have a cool cucumber? I don't really know. But um, all right. There's a little painting for you. And I'll go back in here in just a second. Watch this and put in some strings. One, two, three, four, and five. And then put in some strings hanging out on the ends like that. And uh, I need a little more of this uh Let's come in with this kind of a dry brush, a little more orange in these feet, I think, just to bring that in. I had this paper too wet. So see, I learned something about this paper. All right, so, <clears throat> and this is what will happen when paper's a little thinner than 140, when it's a rough, even though it's cold press, it doesn't have the undulation, it doesn't have the cotton in it, the water is going to take off a little more. It's going to wind up with a good hard edge right here because I left a little space. But at the same time, you're going to find that you're dealing with uh, a constant um, 
the a constant change. And so here's here's what I mean by that. Someday you're going to land on the. This is why I try out different papers in front of you, and this is why I'm not worried about failing. Is is what's going to happen? Is this you're going to find the one that you love. You're going to say like like Chris has already done that. She says, you know, of all the papers out there, I know if I use 140 uh, hot press, that's where my that's where my paintings pop. Pat likes a Canson paper, or she used to. That's a little smoother because she used Tombow and uh, uh, Micron pens. And if she uses another paper, it'll eat them alive. And so you think, wow, I just used that one pen, and I threw away a $4 pen on a painting that I don't know if I'm going to do anything with. You have to learn to use what you love to use. But before you get to that, I'm just telling you, don't start with inferior stuff. Get out of the copy paper mode and at least jump up to 110 or above. And in fact, I'd say 120 or 138 and above if you're going to do decent watercolor. Can you do little sketches like this on 90 pound sketch paper? You can. Uh, can you do lighter paper if it has a vellum cover on it? You can. Um, some of my favorite crazy paper and the cat let's just purchase a piece from me the other day is these flower pages inside this Kilimanjaro pack. I love it. It's got, it's got a vellum finish on it. It holds watercolor. Uh, the water rolls around, but it is fun to sketch on with a fountain pen. It just races across. In fact, it's so slick that a fly couldn't light on it. And uh, so I got to come back in here with my uh, uh, pin tail. I'm working with a pin tail. This is the 07 inner gel. Look, he pulled it out. There it is right there. Um, haven't used it in a while. I still go back and use a lot of pin tail pins. I want a little shadow down here under this room with a little bit of, of just a little bit of that royal amethyst, just a little bit of a purple shadow. Give some um, um, courtesy to the little uh, the sun shining there. Maybe come in here now. Uh, come in like this. This thing has a handle on this side right here. See that? It's a rounded off uh, <coughs> brass. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm still fighting it. Yeah, I am fighting it. I keep saying I'm going to do something about it, but I have been taking stuff. Probably not something. This is probably where if I were a hot toddy drinker, I'd probably have knocked this thing out already, but I'm not. Okay, here we go. I'm not against it. I just hate it. I just hate the taste. So uh, here's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to put some sound holes in this banjo. There's one. There's one. There's one. There's one. See, I'm just doing a little detail here. This is what you can do uh, in watercolor that just is enough of a detail to go, shoot, I believe that guy's been around a banjo before. Some little fret bars here. Put a few in here like this. Maybe I could come in with a little, doesn't even have to show up. Look, I'm going to grab my little dagger brush here, which is tiny. Go in and get some, some of this titanium white. Just kind of stiff little titanium white. and Go right in here. And just do a little bit of a star on the front of this to remind me of my old banjo. There it is right there. It doesn't even have to look like a star. And then I can grab a little bit of that titanium and just go bop, 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 bop. And there's the tuning pins. And look, those two little spots right there, if you can see them, I think you can. You, you just created this banjo that looks like a banjo. Now it looks like it's supposed to have some life to it. It looks like it's playable. Uh, and maybe he's playing George Bizet's Habanero. I'll have to look that up and see if anybody like Bella Flick or anybody has played that on a banjo. I kind of feel like they probably have not. Anyway, kind of fun to, uh, to find a little piece like that every now and then. Okay, so there's the little rude playing the banjo. Uh, uh, Apple picking time in uh, in something. I don't know. I'm going to come up with a, a, phrase, a, a term of this. Uh, see what I did here on this apple butter pot? I made it sort of round. And uh, I might even put some apples laying down here like he's just dumped some out. Here's one right here. There's one. There's one. There's one. There's one there. Uh, some. They look like tomatoes, don't they? Yeah, that does. Dim in that. And let's go. These are uh, these are going to be um, uh, stamen wine sap. So you thought they were going to be uh, you thought they were going to be Macintosh, didn't you? No. Yeah. Uh, 
if you get some, if you're up in the Carolinas and you get some Stamen wine stabs, you have, uh, you have found the apple that is my apple of choice. There they are, right there. Some apples laying down there. All right, so there we go. All right, I uh, could come in here and do a little bit of uh, just some ticking like this, just to add some feathers coming around like this. I always love to do that. Some dimples out here on the legs, and uh, now what I'm doing is I'm just doing some afterthought detail with uh, with uh, with this pen. Maybe a little few marks here. And if I want my rooster to look a little wiry, I'll let my pen just drag through that and create some stuff like that. Um, I would have loved to have had a little more of, uh, 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 what am I trying to say, holidays right in here, but the paper got away with me. So there's something that I learned already about this paper. It'll take off and uh, run away with you because it doesn't have the cotton in it. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't like it. That's still a good little painting. I like it. All right, question. Take the, take the... Oh, <laughs> Laura Logan says, take the quercetin. I don't know what that is, quercetin. But if that's something I spray up my nose, no, I'm allergic to it. Okay, but I'll look at it. Um, <laughs> so you might have to send me a, a, a message for that. Um, don't make a big deal over my cucumber painting. There's a bluegrass song for you right there. I used to sit on my grandparents' porch and peel apples until my thumb was stained with apple. I complained and complained, but winter my nanny made fried apple pies. Oh my gosh. I'm a fried peach pie guy myself. Uh, in fact, uh, I used to have a friend that come up and do videos for us. And when he would come up here, I said, don't you arrive at my house without some of your uh, nanny's uh, homemade fried pies, man. She could kill it. My mom too. I have her pan. All right, let me do another piece of this just so you can see. Um, same paper, okay? Here's the same paper. Voila. Um, this paper, no, this is a little different paper. That's the paper out of there. This is a little different paper. Um, but I'm going to do less water and let you see what this looks like with less water. And I'm going to do this on a shrimp again just because it's something different. It'll, 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 it'll switch you back over. Get me out of the opera bluegrass mode um, on this one. And I'll come up with a caption for this. I'll do probably a little more detail once this dries a little bit. And that's the other thing that you'll find. Watercolor dries faster on 100% cotton, 140 pound. It dries slower on hot press or thinner paper that's 120 pound or less. In fact, I don't like to paint watercolor on less than that. But I can't say that I don't. But I also don't get the boldness, nor do I use the depth of water and color. Great example here on like 90 pound sketch pad paper. Why did I have this? I was on the road taking notes on a little bit of everything, and I just sat down at a table one day and just sketched these three little fishing flies that I remembered, some of the flies that I used to tie. Uh, so that's how that comes to be. All right. Uh, this, I see a couple things that I changed about this painting already now that I picked it back up. I'd probably put a little bit of shadow on this one side right here, like this. Yeah, there we go. See there? Just did it. Voila, gives it a little bit and then I dry my brush and then drag this with a dry brush just down like this to just let feather that shadow in. Do you ever do that? If you don't do that, you should start doing that sometimes just on paper to get a feel for what I'm talking about. Remember, sometimes you just want to go back and you want to go back and you want to, want to practice what you forgot to practice a long time ago. Um, just do this sometimes when you're sitting. And by the way, those of you who are teaching kids and grandkids this summer, uh, teach them on, on how to draw balloons, okay? Just take a balloon like this. I'm so ADD. I love it. But if I take a balloon like this and I just grab a watercolor brush, let's say they just got a regular little uh, play watercolor brush. Ta-da! Here's one from Cheap Joe's as part of the Starving Artist Program. They sent me probably about 30 of these brushes. And this is probably the last one I have left. I used them for a foster uh, child painting thing I was doing recently. And so I gave those kids brushes. So Cheap Joe's sent me these. Um, they're called Starving Artist. It's a program by which you can... You know the story of the starving artist. Uh, you know that uh, it's uh, brushes for Vincent was the concept that Joe Miller came up with. Joe Miller has, has, was, has been a fan of Van Gogh, Van Gogh forever, and he tells the story. He used to tell it theatrically even, but part of that is he started a program called Starving Artist or um, Brushes for Vincent, and it's because Van Gogh's brother Vincent or uh, Vincent, uh, excuse me, 
Vincent Van Gogh's brother uh, was really responsible for uh, Vincent's art, and he helped. He raised the money to give him the supplies, and so that's kind of you can you can put money into a, a thing for Cheap Joe's, and he'll make sure that kids have art supplies. Do you know when I went to Africa in 2010, we had just met Joe Miller and his team, and my son was still in App- just coming out of Appalachian, uh, which is where his main store is in Boone. Uh, Appalachia College is there, uh, Appalachian State. And uh, we went over and said, hey, we're going to be uh, doing some art with some kids in Africa. And they said, we took a whole box of papers and arts and brushes and supplies. And we have some art. There was a young man that the first day we were there, we were there 10 days. We gave him some art supplies and just said, go and, and be an artist. And, and he, before we left, he came back on a Sunday afternoon and brought us several little pieces of rolled up. We have one of those framed downstairs. It's fantastic. And, and you know, it's not, this is not a personal pride story, but it's like, whoa, we helped him start. And so um, that's the kind of stuff I love. So for me to uh, remember this, you, you get a little water, you put a little water in a brush and you just put a little water on here like this. And you can't even hardly see me, see the water on there. You probably can't see it at all. And then I'm going to make this red so you can really see it. And then I just go in there and I put some red in like this and I let it just go in there on the side like this. And then I wash my brush out. Clean brush. Uh, I take a paper towel, wash it out, and I go one, two, three, and then I come and I start just letting this brush follow this, letting this paint follow this dry brush on over. So now I'm using a dry brush, but I'm allowing it to the paint just to follow the dampness of the brush over. And so I get this look coming across this page of this. I left a little holiday there, and I get this. So you see the difference in teaching a child to paint a balloon like that? as opposed to painting a balloon like this. And this is how, you know, this is how Miss Wilson teaches the kids to paint balloons in the first grade. Okay, kids, let's just make all the balloon red as red we can be, because we all know balloons are red. And so then you have to go back and go, but what about the sunspots? Well, then you have to put in the white but then the white doesn't go in right, and then it gets muddy, and then you think, well, if it has a little shadow in it, so then you think, well, I got a little blue reflection. And before you know it, you don't have a great balloon at all. You've just kind of got a glob of brown paint. And so, see the difference here? Okay, all right. I hope you. I do this stuff sometimes, and I and I forget that people are new to the show, and they just come in and they go, I don't understand how to use a a wet brush, a dry brush, a damp brush. And so there's a good example of that right there. If you're teaching your kids, boom, uh, that really works. Um, all right, Ding. here we go. I got a couple more minutes. I'm going to paint this shrimp on this piece of paper here and just show you how uh, this is this is the paint that I hope Hobby Lobby puts on their uh, in their uh, mixed media sketchbook. I'd love to sketch with that. And by the way, that reminds me to a journal time, a travel time. And uh, so this week, I have my final conversation with uh, the folks <clears throat> in Jekyll Island to see if we can make that work. And uh, I've, I've been talking to some folks, maybe putting a little uh, store there, uh, just a, a little pop up uh, one afternoon, two tables of art supplies, maybe from Cheap Joe's uh, at a good price. So if you needed to come in and pick up some things, you could do that. Um, and uh, we'd all be on the same page and some journals and things like that. And so then I don't have prices yet. I don't have everything, but I'm still pointing that direction. I may just pull the reins in and say, whoa, now's not the time. I've got Carol and I have to look at our schedules and what I've got going on in my business. So, but it's still on the drawing board. Okay, so here's uh, here's that little uh, here's that little shrimp for you that sometimes I just paint. He's got this little, I had, sh- uh, I had shrimp this weekend. <clears throat> You know, Carol comes in from Colorado, and Carol is wired uh, to go. That's just her mindset. So I know she's uh, I'm saying, hey, what do you want me to fix for dinner tonight? And uh, that wasn't even in the question. I said, hey, uh, let's go see the grandkids, get them ready to go off to camp. Not that we're getting them ready, but we wanted to just go visit with them a little before they headed off to camp. And then we said, uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll just stop and have dinner somewhere. So I had shrimp. And, uh, you know, it's kind of sad. Other than being in Florida, uh, Charlotte has these two restaurants that fly in shrimp all the time. And I'm telling you what, 
Uh, it's hard to get a better shrimp than those guys are dishing out. All right. Um, let me go back to this brush and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Now, I have traded in my Yasutoma because, nope, that wouldn't be fair. Let me use it and use it with a lighter touch of water. So I'm tapping it a little more and I'm going to go in and I'm just going to put a little bit of water this time. Just a tad because I want to keep a little more. So you can't even probably see it. But what you can see is where I put that pin and I, I sketch with a pin tail. Um, needle point, needle point, 05. And I'm going to come in like this, and then I'm going to grab myself, and I'm going to pre-mix some color here. Watch this. I'm going to go in with a little bit of orange, a little bit of yellow, a touch of red, just another touch of red. Oh, that's way too much. So now I'm going to have enough paint to do uh, an entire covey of shrimp. What is shrimp in a covey? What is a school? I don't, I don't know if shrimp school or not. Is it? I didn't school much, I'll tell you that. Okay, so there's a little bit of uh, shrimp color, I think. That's going to be good. Oh, yeah, see how that's kind of like a little pale yellow, orange, red. Um, and then uh, some of you were commenting on my uh, shrimp the other day that had a little bit of uh, 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 Terry Tardy turquoise in him. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Um, going like, whoa, that shrimp sort of got away from me. And I go, nah, I, just, I wanted him to have a little bit of that because, you know, shrimp have this... Uh, uh, last night, I gave this young man, the waiter at the restaurant, a little shrimp, and he said, oh, this reminds me of one of those rainbow butter, butter, butter shrimps. And I'm going like, who the heck are you? How would you know that? And uh, his name was David, and uh, he did a great job serving us, and so I'd sketched a little shrimp there at the table. All right, so there I'm done. See how long that took? A little bit of water, a little less water than I did here, and so I'm able to retain some of those hard edges and some holidays. This I didn't as much because I piled it in. And by the way, remember, this is thinner paper, and so it's going to warp out a little bit. Lay it flat. Let it dry. It's going to frame just fine. What happens if you keep pouring the water in on thinner paper? It's going to start to pull in its fibers, and then it's going to look crinkled, and you're going to get a crease, and you don't want to do that. If you do that, the, the rule is you've used too much water. And so um, waste a little paper, people. It's okay to waste some paper. Okay, if you don't do that, you're going to miss out on some great opportunities to learn. Uh, chop some paper up and do some short little pieces. Put a little red right in here, just like this, because they always have just a little more red in their legs. And underneath, you'll find some in the jaw, on the nose point. And, um, and so there's a, little, uh, there's a little shrimp. That's a little too much red right here that got away from me. So I'm going to go in and just touch some of that out like that. And... Uh, and of course, you know what I do sometimes for my water. 959, watch this. I'm going to drop a little bit right here, just a little spray, and put a little uh, ultramarine blue there, just like this. And I'm going to grab my drinking straw. I got a thin one here. I got a big one here. Here we go. Boom. Might do that on the other side, uh, just because I'm not s symmetrical. <laughs> All right, so there we go. There's a little shrimp flying around. Love it, love it, love it. All right, hey, um, <laughs> even if you get a date for next year to go to Jekyll, that would be great too. Okay, thank you. Um, by the way, I want to go in uh, October, so it would, should be beautiful there, and there still should be all sorts of things here in the south to uh, paint, but I'll keep you posted on that and talk to them this week. Actually, is on my drawing board, so... Hey, thanks for being a part of the show. Um, thanks for uh, letting me just kind of do what I do and, and uh, talk about paper and paint and encouraging you to think like an artist. Tomorrow morning will be a good news room for those of you on Patreon. Patreon is, uh, those of you who don't know what Patreon is, it's, uh, it's a way to support what I do, to have me my time to think and, and practice and put together uh, the class. First, Tuesday of the month, I paint a 90-minute uh, drive down. Some of you should be reading and journaling and working on that. So this paper, take that into context, too. Um, the, Tuesday, the, other, the other shows, Tuesday, the second, third, and fourth Tuesdays, are just a 20-minute uh, breakdown of as we journal through cup of tea. That's what that is. Journal through the Gospel of Matthew, and that's been a fun thing to do. Storytelling time. So that's on Patreon. If you want to go Rudoodle's Patreon, that's what that's about. It's $11.57 a month.
to support me in what I do. And I do those two classes. I'll try to continue all I can to paint on Mondays and Saturdays and uh, do an auction every now and then. That helps me keep the boat floating art-wise too. Blessings to you all. Thanks for letting me be a part. Last cup of tea here. I uh, love keep keep up Roos Crew. Your uh, community is brilliant. How you support each other, how you share your art. Keep doing that. Keep teaching kids to paint that you bump into. Keep encouraging them to think like artists. And uh, right now I've got a name. In fact, I got a new name on the board that I'm just going to lift up uh, this morning. A little sip of tea. Uh, text somebody or send it out right now. Send a couple texts right before the show. And so, uh, and I got a couple of grandkids at camp this week, so they're on my brain. Blessings to you. I'm out of here like a herd of turtles. Ooh, mm. Where is that orchestra that always plays me out? Mm.